Okay, I want you to imagine a world without electricity. Now, of course, there, there was a time when there was no electricity, and I'm sure that those times were tough in being able to provide for your family and keep them safe. I'm sure that was like a daily chore, but somehow man still managed to get it all done. But what about today? What would life be like without all the luxuries that we've become used to? In fact, the luxuries we've become dependent on since those days without electricity, without things like dependable food or a clean water supply, our banking system, your toilet. How would our country, your state, your town, even the immediate space around your home, how would things transform right before your eyes? Now, if you think that this type of a scenario isn't a reality that you'll ever have to deal with, you may want to think again. The threat to our national electrical grid is so powerful that government experts, including NASA and the CIA, have warned that a long-term disruption could wipe out as many as 281 million Americans in just the first year. But not surprisingly, very few people are actually doing anything to get ready. In fact, they're relatively clueless about the dangers that we face, even perhaps in the near future. Now, fortunately, there are a few people who are speaking out to help the everyday warrior out there take the steps that you need to in order to prepare now. And one of those influential activists and preparedness guides is here with us today. Hey there, Warriors. Jeff Anderson here, Executive Director of Warlife.com, the Warlife Academy. And I'm here with my friend and survival expert, consultant, and best-selling author, Jonathan Hollerman. Jonathan, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, Jeff. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, it's good to be here. I appreciate you taking time. I know you've been running all over the country, and uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on specific to the things that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm really looking forward to, to digging into these things. I think it's going to be a real, uh, real eye-opener for a lot of people. So um, listen, everybody, if you haven't listened to any of our past interviews or workshops that we've done with Jonathan before, he is a former Air Force elite SEER instructor who has trained hundreds of students in how to survive under the most extreme circumstances, including in the harshest weather conditions and under extreme food and sleep deprivation. Now, today, Jonathan has gone on to take his own unique survival background, experience, and philosophies to a much larger audience through his best-selling books such as EMP, Equipping Modern P Patriots, uh, survival Theory, A Preparedness Guide, which was the first survival theory book, as well as his latest release, which is the basis of today's show, Survival Theory 2, The Psychology of Human Desperation, Starvation, and Living Without Rule of Law in a Long-Term Grid-Down Scenario. Now, in addition, he's now the Deputy Director of the U.S. Task Force on National and Homeland Security. And that's important because I want you to understand that Jonathan is not just you know some YouTube influencer guy playing video games down in his mom's basement, who's occasionally like regurgitating old, probably really bad information out there about survival. Like he's somebody that even the government now is listening to regarding the threat that we're going to be talking about today. Now, he's also gone on to help others benefit from his background by offering personalized preparedness consulting and everything from putting together your personal survival plan to planning, buying and building your own survival retreat. Now, for more information about Jonathan and his training and services, please go ahead and visit him on his website at griddownconsulting.com. All right, Jonathan, we have we have a lot to talk about here, man. Um, listen, I I always talk about like there are there are other events that could literally change life as we know it. But you have understandably been most concerned about a cataclysmic collapse of our nation's electrical grid from things like an electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic pulse or EMP from something like a nuclear attack or a solar flare or some form of sabotage to our high voltage transformer network from either like a cyber or even a physical attack now from our enemies, both foreign and domestic. So I, I know that this is a lot to unpack all in one question. And I know you have a lot of like just a ton of information inside of your survival theory books, but as condensed as you're able to, for those people that maybe aren't as familiar with the grid threat that we face as a nation, how bad is this threat? How immediate is this threat? And then how prepared is our government, whether that's local, national, whatever, for this kind of threat? Sure. So that those are three actually very in-depth questions that I could spend multiple hours on each one. I'm going to try and keep them as brief as possible. How bad is the threat? This is without question the worst case scenario for America 
Uh, the the EMP Commission, Congressional EMP Commission, called it a continental time machine and America's Achilles heel. They are the ones that first warned Congress back in 2004 that if we had a national loss of the electric grid for a, a long term loss, we're not talking about just a power outage, but a, a destruction to the electric grid, which leaves us without power for as as long as a year or even longer. Uh, they estimate that 90% of Americans would die within the first year. So as far as like the severity of the threat, there is no, I mean, outside of all out nuclear war with Russia and China, where we nuke the entire planet, this is the worst case scenario. And I would even contend that it's, it's worse than I would rather probably have a nuke dropped on my head than, than slowly starve to death in a world without food with your family. You, you know, it may sound grim, but so as far as the severity of the threat, it is the worst possible thing. How immediate is the threat? Obviously, we, we don't ever know. If you were to isolate each one of these threats, uh, the EMP threat, uh, HEP, nuclear EMP threat, the, ge the geomagnetical, uh, or, uh, the uh, GMD threat, the solar flare threat from the sun, which is we're 50 years past due for a Carrington size level event. Uh, you've got physical attacks. We're seeing it in, in North Carolina, Oregon, Washington. You're seeing an increase in physical attacks on the electric grid. The, the utilities are not doing their job in protecting these locations. You've had we've had the cyber threat. Russia, China, many countries are inside of our grid. They've been there for many, many years, and uh, it's growing with artificial intelligence and quantum. Uh, you know, right? I, I was I usually say on the horizon, but artificial intelligence with ChatGPT. You know, we were watching this. It's here now. But with quantum computing and the algorithms that are coming down the road. So it is something that, to be honest, I, I'm surprised we haven't been attacked yet because we're so completely vulnerable uh, to this type of threat because our grid has not been hardened and no one's taken it serious. The electric utilities are kicking the can down the road and hiding the threat. The American people, 99% of them, 99.9, .9, have no idea that there are viable, realistic, and actually pre-planned methods in which a, a foreign government or a foreign terrorist group could take down our grid permanently, destroy it. So, you know, where you can't rebuild it, right? Uh, that concept uh, kind of rattles some people. What do you mean we can't fancy? We'll just grab some electricians and, you know, we'll duct tape and we'll get the thing back up and running. And, and so we talked before the high voltage transformers, they take 12 to 18 months to build. They come from South, uh, uh, South Korea and Germany, typically, excuse me, they come from South Korea and Germany, typically, more coming from China, but they take 12 to 18 months to build. If those are destroyed in our country, 3,000 of them, we're not getting the first replacement for 12 to 18 months. So uh, so that's the immediateness of the threat, uh, and that, that lends to how prepared is our, is our government. 100% not. So a couple of years ago, I was invited to be a part of Electromagnetic Defense Task Force down at the LeMay War Gaming Center. Uh, and it was a three-day joint services. All your alphabet agencies were there. The All four branches of the military were there. There's about 300. And it was a war gaming scenario on a EMP and the military's response and the government's response to that. And it was jaw-dropping to me because I knew the military wasn't prepared before then. But going through that exercise and just seeing – there's there, there's no plan. If you get nothing else from this interview, there's no plan at the federal level. There's no plan at the military level to respond to a nationwide grid down event. The military is 99% resilient or is 99. The U.S. military is 99% reliant on the civilian electric grid. They've warned Congress that if the civilian electric grid comes down, they will be unable to respond. OK, they have 48 hours of backup diesel on the base, the food, the, the, the interstate trucking that stops in this country, the food stops coming onto the base, just like everywhere else. Within a week, they're going to be out of food, just like everyone else. There's no box trucks coming down the road to pass out MREs. Federal government has no plan to deal with this. It's, it's considered beyond design basis. So at the end of the day, you are on your own. No one will come to help you. And it is. It, you know, if it is an EMP or solar flare, it's going to be a protracted end of civilization event. And you better have a really solid plan of action if you want to survive that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great job with unpacking all of that in one question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we this is something we could, uh, I know we talk about this a lot, and this is something that, I don't think it takes a lot, for, though, for people to really understand the concept of it. There are certainly enough movies out there about it, but I think the movies in reality are are two very, very different things. Like, I think people understand that there are threats out there, at least if they're listening to us right now, if they're watching us on our on the stream, they they're watching for a reason. Like they're somebody who considers themselves most likely relatively awake to what the threats are. But but there's also a lot that I think most people really don't understand, no matter and even beyond their imagination. Now you do offer some advice in your survival theory two book for gear and strategies for prepping and things like that, but it's largely about helping readers understand the realities of the people threat and the psychological effects and dangers that a long-term grid down scenario is going to have on the population. I think that's what one of the things that makes it like just very, very unique and real eye-opening for people. Now, you break down everything into like three key areas. So I wanted to get your thoughts on each one of these and what you think our followers need to know most about each of these. Now, the first one I want to I want to start with here is the level of desperation that's going to be experienced by the masses and what that will look like for those who aren't prepared. Can you dig a little bit deeper into the element of desperation and what that does to people? Sure. So human desperation. Uh, so the, the three main areas that I discuss are, are human desperation, starvation and living without rule of law. And at the end, you know, after we get done covering each one individually, it's tying the three together that's that we've never seen in human history, right? But the first thing that people don't really understand is the concept of human desperation. We live in a world that makes sense today. Uh, I mean, literally, we're, we're not, the, you don't have the risk of Vikings coming down your river, coming into your town, you know, beheading people and carrying off your, your wife and kids, right? The, the, the reality that we live in today, law, order, things make sense. You go out of your door, you get in your car, you drive to work. Uh, if you get hurt, you go to a hospital. If you're walking down the street and you know you, make, you have conversations, there's no threat that he's, well, there's very little threat that he's going to kill you or attack you or try and do something severe. You lock your doors at night with these like little finger locks and you just assume with glass windows on your house that nobody's going to firebomb your house or, or try and take things over. So you just, we live in this normalcy bias where it's just our world makes sense. And it's, you can't do like psychological study of human desperation because every person reacts different to different scenarios. But at the end of the day, it's basically a world out of control. When, when things grow so foreign to your senses and to your way of processing information in your brain, uh, you, you get desperate, right? Uh, a good example I use sometimes is as a father, you know, a, a month into this event, the grocery stores were cleaned out on day three, no interstate trucking that's never resupplied. You're, you, let's say you have a six-year-old daughter, parents will understand this, laying on the couch, she is starving to death. She's gray, she's gaunt, she's she's not getting off the couch at this point. She's looks like a, a, a little girl stepped out of a Holocaust movie, right? And it's your daughter, you failed her, even though it's not your fault, you haven't been able to feed her. She She's looking at you with those eyes what wouldn't you do as a mother or father to get that child some food? So this idea that we're trapped in this box where, you know, in a lot of fiction and Hollywood, bad things happen in movies, uh, prepper fiction, EMP fiction. When something bad happens to somebody, it's always the bad guy that does it. It's always good people, bad people here. And they, they don't understand that, the ability of good people to do insane atrocities. Um, Philip Zabarda, world-renowned psychologist who did the Stanford prison experiments back in the 70s, has a book called The Lucifer Effect. And his life's work is studying how a farm boy from Kansas can go to Vietnam, commit horrific atrocities over there, uh, you know, lots of bad, do lots of bad things, come back and be a car salesman. How a, a Nazi could work at a 
at a Holocaust camp and do horrific things. And they find him 10 years later. And he's like a, a father figure in the home. He's working a nine to five job, right? Like th this idea that when bad things happen, it's just bad people. But human desperation will push people out of their comfort zones and they will be they will do things that they never thought possible. So it's hard to quantify. It's hard to really explain that that one portion of it, human desperation. But, you know, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think that, you know, we, we've seen this before and I've seen this in, in combat as well, where when people lose things now, it could be their house gets bombed. It could be um, even just understanding that the conditions have changed, because I think that everybody gets used to your daily routine. In fact, it's funny because we, we talk oftentimes about like I have family members that I love dearly that I haven't talked in like years because I just have my daily routine. Like if it doesn't affect my dinner table, I, you know, it's like, I love them, but it's just part of what my life is like. Now we all have our lives. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't hold that against other people and I don't have it hold, held against me. So we have what has become normal to us and moving outside of that a little bit here and there, like you go on a vacation or you get a flat tire most people can kind of deal, I say most people, most people can kind of deal with those things. And some people just can't even deal with that. I've seen people in in natural disasters lose their entire home and just the look on their face, you would use the word desperation. This loss of hope, multiply that times a billion for understanding that it's not your house that you've lost. It's like everything around you has now been flipped upside down and there's no white hat calvary coming to save you like it's you and you're and when you start when you start viewing some of the things that you're talking about the brain can't comprehend it even if you've i mean i always tell people like you, you can't comprehend combat just because you watched a rambo movie or something like you it's just it's not even in the same universe it's really hard for people to do this and i know that you've also done a lot of studying on real world history for people that have gone through these types of life-changing events. In fact, the next factor that you talk about in your book are the effects of starvation. And I think that most people can at least imagine that their local grocery stores are gonna be cleaned out very quickly at the first sign of crisis. Like they've seen the news. Of course, anytime that there's an opportunity for opportunists, the predators of our society, the wolves, to be able to just take advantage of, like there's a, there's a smashed in, front window of a 7-Eleven, like they're just going to go in there and loot the whole thing. But but what do you think people aren't expecting about what they'll see and experience as a result of a scenario where our food supply is completely gone and starvation is a very real factor? Yeah, I, I, people just don't understand that without electricity, food in this country is a zero-sum game. What I mean is that our... It, our just-in-time food delivery system, you buy a can of peaches at the at the grocery store, they swipe it at the cash register, there's an electronic signal that goes from there to the distribution center, put another can of uh, peaches on the next truck. The distribution center, there's a signal that goes from there to the canning facility, put another can of peaches on the next truck. Canning facility to the farm down in Mexico that's growing the peaches. There's all these signals that take place in our world that, that they must be there in order for everything to happen just like that. There's no storerooms. or I don't know if anybody's snuck in the back of their grocery store lately, but it's not like it was in the 80s and 90s when I grew up. We could walk back there and they you know, had all this stuff and you could say, hey, can you check for this in the back? That just doesn't happen these days. So having an understanding that when that food, it, it all relies on interstate trucking and, and electronic signals. When that stops, the food that's at your grocery store, the food that's physically in your city is all that exists. That, that's it. It's period. Once that food is gone, it's there's no resupply. The government's not stepping in. The, there's no physical. It's not even possible to consider feeding 330 million Americans spread out across this massive landmass without electricity, interstate trucking, computers, uh, computer networks, all that stuff. So. I think that's going to be the biggest shock is that once, you know, they know the grocery stores are going to get looted within three days and then the distribution centers and the other mom and pop shops and stuff like that, day four, day five. I think what people will be shocked is like day two, or I'm sorry, week two, 
they're gonna be sitting around okay all right when's this gonna end now you know when's when's the calvary coming well who's who's working on this because you have to remember there's no tv there's no radio there's no internet there's no banking there's no heat no air conditioning this raw sewage is probably backing up into your house putting dangerous levels of methane unless you have the the long key on the pole to shut the sewer off at the road uh, there's a lot of things that people just don't consider uh, and the effects of starvation on humanity is something that you have to read history so there's the very limited studies on starvation there's one that i'm like an actual serious study and that's the minnesota starvation experiment that was in uh the early 40s during world war ii conscientious objectors uh, that didn't want to go to war volunteered to be essentially starved for six months to so they could study how their bodies reacted to to that and it's a really fascinating study uh, and then you see the dramatic effects after six months that these men went through transformation of their body they they, they looked like skin and bones and and then you realize that they didn't starve them they gave them 1500 they gave them half rations which was 1500 calories a day the, the the effects on their body some of them got went nuts some of them were cutting each other cutting themselves they they you know they were in a regulated environment they got two meals a day they listened to the radio watched baseball they you know they could call their family their family was said there's nothing desperate and they were still getting 1500 calories a day and that's what they look like it's shocking but that's really the only study on starvation because it's not like you can just grab somebody off the street and be like hey i'm gonna starve you for six months with no ramifications right those kind of studies are never going to happen again so that one's important uh but what you really have to do is go back and look at history and the holomador the chinese famine uh the holocaust the bosnian conflict i there's two of the most Important books you should check out, or I would say three, is uh, Red Famine by Anne Applebaum. Uh, Mao's, sorry, I have to look over my shoulder here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, three books you really... <laughs> at least one you have to read <laughs> it's like I, I do have to read it now no, but there is the, there is a lot of stuff in the um i mean in your book also you give references to like this is I history do. this isn't like we're not i didn't put my tinfoil hat on and like start spouting out stuff that i i saw in a zombie movie exactly that's what that's what i'm saying is like history is so important uh red famine by ann applebaum Mao, uh mao's great mao's great famine uh by frank Dick Tour, I think his name. There, there's a bunch of books on history that give firsthand accounts. This is what's key. It says, this isn't fiction. This is firsthand historical accounts. And when you read these books, you get a completely different reality than what you see in Hollywood or what the other preparedness guys are telling you. Like, oh, you know, board, you know, work together with your neighbors and, you know, everything's going to be hunky-dory. You're going to realize that these cultures had extreme close neighborhoods, close family ties, strong work ethic, life skills that we don't have today. They had all this stuff and their communities completely fell apart. It was every man for themselves in rural China and rural Ukraine where these people were religious and all these factors where you'd say, if these people in the 40s in Ukraine with life skills that we can't even dream about and work ethic and, you know, if they can't do it, what makes you think you're going to do it? You know, the guy, like you mentioned, playing video games in his mom's basement, you know, because you watch some YouTube videos. It's So starvation is the effects, the, the starvation psychosis that's going to happen to people is going to take them on top of their human desperation. You're not going to be able to rationalize with people two or three weeks into this. So everyone's like, oh, we're going to have a plan. We're going to form groups. We're going to kumbaya. We're going to hold hands. We're that works yes america's always picked ourselves up by the bootstraps but there's always food been there you take food out of the equation you put people in i don't mean like just hungry people i mean people that are starving to death that are eating bark off the trees that are softening leather and eating leather because there's nothing left to eat right uh when you get to that state there's no there's no organizing people there's no rationalizing it's just you know it's it's gonna fall yeah. it's gonna fall apart this country's gonna fall apart so much faster and so much deeper 
than people realize is my point. Yeah. And I think, I mean, and the word you used also, I, I think is important, like this the starvation psychosis. Uh, the only experience that I've ever, I've ever had with it um, personally was I, in my bodybuilding days, like I was dieting down for a photo shoot and everything. And so I, I did two weeks, you know, you can only get down to like a certain body fat, but then you've got to like, just take out all the water and everything else. And you've just got to like get down to like paper thin skin. And so I did, I did two weeks in my la in my final phase, getting ready for the shoot. And I had zero carbs, zero, not, not even a blade of grass for two weeks. And the first couple of days were fine. Like I had lots of energy and everything. My body started to like feed off of the body fat, getting rid of all that stuff and everything. But eventually like I went from laughing hysterically for no, no reason at all to crying like a baby in like a half a second. Like I just, I, my brain, and then I was trying to work. And again, like you said, like I had other luxuries there. I had my family, I had television, I had things that to, to, that I could distract myself with, but there was no getting over that my emotions, my decision-making skills, uh, my, my level of empathy with my family, my tolerance level of my family, like everything of the dog, everything just got to a point where I don't even know who I am right now. And um, boy, I was ready for like, as soon as that photo shoot was done, I was like scarfing down lasagna, like you wouldn't even believe, but uh, like, <laughs> I don't think people really understand, I don't people understand what happens in the brain chemically. Um, and that's even like with your own body, your own brain. Now add to that, in fact, you know, I would challenge somebody to take like a picture of their child or a picture of their spouse. And, you know, you probably don't need Photoshop these days. There's all kinds of things you can probably just do on your phone and take a picture of somebody who is maybe from the Holocaust, like somebody who's anorexic or like really gaunt and like transposed. And imagine looking at your family just wasting away for somebody that considers themselves a warrior, a protector, some, a provider for their family to feel the failure that goes along with that and not being like of being judged of not being able to take care of your family. Where would you go to, to deal with that? Where would you go to solve that? You would go to any length you possibly could. If it's me versus them, what would be to them, I guess. Right. So, so I think, and which brings up another aspect of this, because I think people, again, we're used to living inside of this box, like you say, with, with rules, with laws, with things like that. And a third factor that you dig into in your book is living in a world without rule of law. Now, I I think this may be where most of our society really has a false perception about their own protection, because I think that they envision that there will be local authorities like police and military units who are going to be able to like help distribute food and there's going to be drinkable water for them. So how accurate is this assumption that people have and what should people really expect to be the reality of, of what they can expect in a long-term grid down event when it comes to rule of law. Sure. So uh, th there's a very popular book uh, about an EMP. Um, I'm not going to list the name of the author, um, but it, it was a very best-selling book in the genre, EMP kind of fiction. And I remember, I think it was five or six days in, there was the, the family that like went down to their local supermarket and the, the, the store manager for the supermarket was sitting outside behind a table and there was a police officer standing next to them and they were letting people go in one at a time and buy up to $50 worth of stuff. And I just, I, I couldn't help but like, like almost like laugh. Like, first of all, that store manager, she has no vested interest in that store. There's no electricity. The, the things will have fallen apart so fast before then. And like when they're when they're tearing the stores apart for food, the store manager doesn't. The store manager is going to be in there with the rest of the people. Okay, they're not. The things change really fast. Police officers, firefighters. Okay, put yourself in a police officer's shoes. Okay, an EMP or a solar flare, whatever. We'll just say we'll say it's an EMP. Okay, uh, you're an NYPD police officer. It hits. Okay, gridlock traffic instantly. All the red lights go blank, crashes, 30 to 40 percent of the cars stop dead in the middle of the street where they're at. Okay, nothing moves. So, first of all, the police can't get around to get anywhere. Their radios do not work. Okay, even if they could find somebody, you know, looting or rioting, there's no uh, coordination. 
There's no way for them. There's no paddy wagon to come pick somebody up that they arrested to take them to the jail. When they get to the jail, there's no lights in the jail. The jail cells are like, they don't, they don't even function probably, you know, even if you could lock somebody in there, but let's say you, you, you did, you, you walk them all the way back to the precinct. You lock them in the cell. There's no judge coming into work. There's no power, right? There's no, there's no, the system stops. There's no computers. There's no way to enter them in because all their stuff's on their car and their, and their little laptop. None of that stuff works, right? So it's going to be so frustrating for a police officer to come to work, don't really know where to go, what to do. I, I'm taking a risk in these all these rioting and looting that's happening out here to go out here on my own or just me and one other guy to go out here and, what, stop random petty crime? It's just, it's going to fall apart so fast. Justifiably, the police, the firefighters, I would even go so far as the military after a couple of days. They're just going to go home to their families. They're going to see the, the the rioting, the looting, the fires. And who's and if you, if you weren't working when it happened, who's going to go into work when you see all this stuff happening around you? Like, hey, honey, you know, I'll be home at five. You know, <laughs> don't mind the, you know, here's the shotgun, you know, for the next guy that comes through the door, right? I, I'll see you at five. I'm going to go clock in. So I... It just all that stuff stops. So uh, without rule of law, it's gonna, it, it will happen and it will happen very fast. And a book that I recommend on that is um, uh, Selko Begovich, The Dark Secrets of SHTF Survival. Uh, he was in Bosnia. He was in a city that got surrounded. They cut the power. He basically lived in a grid down scenario for, for a year and he a modern city and how fast it fell apart into warlords, street by family by family, street by street. Uh, they they basically broke down into groups, then it, our families, then they were fighting each other, and then it turned to groups, and there's limited resources, right, and turned to warlords. Um, and people just think that's not going to be a reality in the U.S., and that's when there's no police, there's no military, there's no government, it's self-rule. And uh, I, I forget which one of the EMP commissioners said it, but like talking about 90% of the American people is dying in the first year, but you don't really want to be around the other 10%. <laughs> You know, because it's going to be the the biggest, baddest guy with the biggest stick that checked his morality at the door to do whatever he needed to do to get the the food for his wife and kids. So, uh, so the what I want to tie together here, the important thing. So we talked about human desperation, starvation, and living without rule of law. And the historical context I talked about, I just talked about Bosnia, right? They had limited starvation. They still got occasional food drop. I mean, they they went hungry. They they starved to a degree, way more than anything. Uh, most people listening to this could imagine, but uh, but there was no rule of law. It was warlords, right? So evil, terrible things happen. If you look at Holomador and you look at the, the Chinese famine, you had extreme levels of starvation and human desperation, but you had serious rule of law. In other words, uh, Stalin and Mao Zedong, they, they, if you were caught stealing, death penalty. If you were caught sneaking into one of the towns to, to try and get food off your farm that you had to stay at that didn't have any food, it was death penalty, right? So the atrocities that we see in these books and this, these historical accounts would have been worse if there was no oversight, right? If there was nobody hurting the cats, you know? In, in America, in, a, in an EMP, solar flare, nationwide grid down event, where you lose all oversight, you have the Lucifer effect from Philip Zabarta, that psychology book I was talking about, talks about too. When you take any oversight or any risk of getting caught and put in jail and normal law and order, normalcy bias, human desperation, and then you take the highest levels of starvation, you put all these things mixed together into one big bag. I, I can't find a time in history where that's been the case. You've always had rule of law or you had one of these things but you know this is going to be a scenario where all three of these converge and it's going to be the most extreme levels of all three and it's going to be uh yeah <laughs> yeah uh, by itself <laughs> it's going to be yeah it's going to be yeah <laughs> you know i think there is some it's interesting because i i, I like how you're right it's, it's kind of like the dominoes start falling and that's it's rather than taking one domino by itself and but people have seen that before like we saw during the the George uh, Floyd protests and the riots and BLM riots and things like that, that even in, I, you know, I think people get conditioned where if you see police cars on fire and people jumping up on down on them, well, we become conditioned that, 
there's not going to really be accountability. You can see the police right there watching it burn. They can't do anything. Like, what are they going to do? They're just not equipped for it. We've seen where even during those riots, and there's certainly other examples, but even during those riots, there were civilians who were setting up checkpoints on roads and on both sides. There was both on like Black Lives Matter. There was like the uh, the right wing groups had their own checkpoints, Like, but everybody was making sure like we want our people to, we want to know where our people are and who's going through here. We're going to, so it became a, everybody against their neighbor, if you will, um, even during those types of situations. And there were deaths. There was a, there was an eight-year-old girl that was shot from a car that went through a checkpoint. And it's much easier to shoot through the back of a car uh, with a firearm because it's kind of like a cowardly way. Like you don't think you're necessarily, like not really aiming for anybody. You're just kind of like, Doing that. And I think that's what happened during that time was in this eight year old girl sitting in the back seat trying to get through this checkpoint was killed. And I think we've seen things like this. We've seen police during Hurricane Katrina that were in there where things were getting looted and taking taking food themselves because they know they realize, OK, everybody's walking away with this food like, you know, what? I'm I'm not going to have any food for my family. And They're so, people too. Yeah. first responders and, and law enforcement. They, they, they're people too. They have families too. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to affect them the same way it really does other people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So we've scared the hell out of everybody now. Um, <laughs> you, you've surveyed, I mean, you've surveyed, surveyed over 500 survival retreats around the world. And, and I know that you've determined that there's no such thing as a one size fits all approach to preparing for surviving this type of a life changing event. But I want to give our followers, you know, something to go off of. So how does a family know where to start? What are what are the first steps that somebody should take to become better prepared for what's ahead, given all the things that we talked about? I know. And again, I know that's that's a lot to unpack in one question. So if maybe just like what are the first three things that from your experience in doing all of these assessments and building out survival retreats for people and things like that. Like, what would you say for the person that's just opening up their eyes now? What are those first three steps that they should be taking? Sure. Without question, the first step is education. Um, any, because this is, this is a battlefield. Uh, the, this idea, you're stepping out of normal life, you're stepping into a battlefield. And any commander that is going to plan an attack on a, a, on an enemy position or battlefield, he's going to want every piece of information that he can gather about the operating environment he's going to be fighting in. It's so important to understand the world that you're stepping into. Uh, so my my book Survival Theory Two, where I talk about the psychology of human desperation, starvation, all these factors, it's so important that you wrap your brain around that. Don't don't take away from the fact that I'm talking about these historical books. Read some of that stuff. Understand the world you're stepping into before you start making plans. Okay, the the kind of the the normal ninety nine percent of preparedness preposphere, we'll call it on YouTube and in, Instagram and wherever else. They'll tell you, hey, this is how you get into prepping. This is how you start prepping. First of all, you start prepping for uh, a tornado and then you step it up to a hurricane and then you then you plan for three days and then you plan for five days. If you start with that mindset of like, I'm just going to put the blinders on and look at this real easy scenario that to be honest with you, I'm going to survive anyway. I may go hungry for a day or two, but fame is going to show up at some point. Right. So instead of doing that, you're never going to get to the point where you're fully prepared mentally. My company model is prepare for the worst, hope for the best, and let God do the rest. I believe that you should wrap your brain around the, the craziest worst case scenario and have a, and start making your plan of action for that. And then anything else that happens in between there, you're covered. You, you don't have a problem. You may not be able to afford to do everything today, but if you're only planning for a financial collapse or some small thing over here, and then this big thing pops off, you're, you know what I mean? It's it's not going to register. You're going to have a hard time. So that's the big thing. Education, uh, understanding the threat before you start spending money. Uh, and part of that is knowing who you're listening to. There are so, it's not just, it's not just the prepper sphere on YouTube. 
It's everything. There's more misinformation online than there is information. There's so many yahoos in every walk of life that are out there. They're the resident expert on something. And you're like, well, this person has no clue what they're talking about. Right. So trying to look at people's background to see what you understand. But at the end of the day, for, you know, the first three steps, education, um, understanding the, the battlefield. Uh, I can't stress this enough. If it's a, an extended grid down event, if it's a, one of these very serious end of society types of events, you must get out of the city early. You must get away from mass population centers early. The, again, the conventional win, win, wisdom, uh, you know, in the prep, prep sphere is, hey, you know, ride it out at home. That's your safe space. You know your neighbor. They'll give you all these reasons on why you need to just stay in suburbia as long as possible. And then if it gets that bad, that, that, then then you know you go out and you leave and you you walk the open road or you do whatever. You know, you, then you bug out without any saying on where to go. I think if you go that route, I mean, if you're staying in the city and it's going to get way worse, and I even have time to describe here, um, but it's going to get so bad, and you're you're going to hang on with your fingernails because. It's too late. It's too late. You know, we're here and some catastrophic thing. Hopefully it's not a death of some family member that's in your household. You know what I mean? Where you're like, okay, we, we got to get out of this. This this whole city's burning to the ground. We have to get out of here. That's the time you want to be out on the open road traveling three days to get to Uncle Bob's farm. No. Uh, so understand that the the biggest threat in this scenario is other people. The, the least amount of people that you can interact with on a daily basis for the first year is your best chance of success for surviving. So if you wanted to build a pie chart and say, hey, if you can get your number close to zero people, the, the least people that you interact with, your better chances, your best chance of survival. Because a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to barter my way through the through the apocalypse and we're going to trade and this and that. That's your people are going to be sizing you up. You don't know if that guy's on his lot. That's his last chicken he's giving you. You know what I mean? He's just sizing you up to rage you later. You, you want to avoid human interaction. Uh, and I realize that probably 95% of the people listening to this are sitting there saying, oh, that's great and all, but I don't have $2 million to hire you to go build a you know multi million dollar survivor tree on the backside of a, a mountain somewhere. I get that. Um, but you know, there are other options. So, you know, this isn't a shameless plug, but in Survival Theory 2, I lay out five or six different options on for from minimal to almost no budget, how you can feasibly get out of the city, even if even if you can't afford a survival retreat. Hey, these are better options. Uh, try this, try that. Uh, one, one of them I'll just throw out is uh, bed and breakfasts, right? Uh, find a remote bed and breakfast breakfast you know and of a dead end road there's a lot of these farm to table bed and breakfasts where they have their own chickens and you know they that's all their stuff and they're usually pretty homesteady type people find that style of bed and breakfast that's not near town you know that's tucked away somewhere just visit it just go there with your wife or your your significant other become don't talk prepping with them just get friendly with them go there every couple months and stay there hey we love this place get to know them talk to them Build a relationship with them. Bring them a gift the next time you come. Build a really good rapport. And then day one, okay, uh, all your survival supplies you keep in a storage unit, Real the, the closest storage unit to that location. That's where all your supplies are. Just show up at that person's place. Hey, here's $300. You know, I, I need a room for the night. We're traveling. They know your face, right? They know things are going on out there, but they know your face. You're friendly. You've you've already done that. They'll invite you in. Don't don't dump it like a cold bucket. You know, hey, I'm a prepper. Take a day or two. Get get let that give you some time. Talk them through this scenario. You know, and then eventually, you know, hey, I've got food down the road. You know, I've got guns, ammunition. We can help provide protection. We can help you garden. Help you with you know protect. We'll we'll help protect your homestead here. Is that a great scenario? No, that, that, that that's not a perfect, but that's a, that scenario, your chance of living through this, if you, it's awkward, it's weird. You know, I, I know people that have, that go and volunteer at farms. I've recommended where they volunteer at a farm. Don't talk prepping, just get to know the farmer, 
you know, an intern, hey, show me how to farm, you know, hey, I want to learn how to do this. Just spend time. That's, but so when you show up there, you're not a stranger, right? It's not the best scenario. But if you don't have money to build a survival retreat and do it properly, it's a lot better than sitting in downtown Atlanta as the city burns around your head and everyone's killing everyone. No food. Your wife and kids are looking at you or your husband and kid. You know, what are we doing you will be in that scenario at some point in time, a month in, two months in. Um, your chances of surviving are much better if you if you ha if you have another plan. So I got a little long winded there. Sorry, Jeff, but I mean there are ways there are ways around this because everyone you know wants to give you this like it, it's a binary choice. Well, you're either staying home or you're living off the open road or living off the national forest. Those are no, I'm not I'm not saying that at all. Don't do that, but. If you understand the threats, the true threats that, that are going to be coming at you, and you know you got to step outside the box and maybe do some awkward things, but you can come up with a better scenario on a budget than just sitting at home and you know people are buying generators in downtown Atlanta, you know backup generators for this, and it's just like you don't think everybody from thousand yards is going to hear that generator running? Yeah, you're going to run yeah. out of diesel sometime. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, and that's and that's golden advice too, because a lot of people, of course, are going to feel that way of like, well, that's great, but I don't have a four wheel drive for my my mountain underground bunker that I can I can drive up to, you know. So, and that's the challenge for a lot of people, and I think that's what keeps people also from even taking the smallest steps. You know, procrastination, I think, is the biggest challenge that a lot of people that want to prepare face. And I think one of the things that I know, and, and just in my consulting with, um, with like our Alexis members for the Academy is that they feel like there's just so much to do. There's so much, there's so many threats to prepare for. There's so much gear I need. There's so much of this that it's, the, it becomes overwhelming and the drawback to sameness of, of staying where you're at just feels more secure or thinking, yeah, I'm going to do that someday gives a false sense of security that someday I will be prepared, but not right today, but I'm going to be. And I think too many people get into, they get too comfortable with that. Um, I think it's a hard leap for them to take. And so, but just small steps can make a big difference. And I love, I love your example of things that you can do like the Airbnb. I've never even thought about that. That's, that's uh that's golden stuff right there, man. So um, I appreciate that. Um, listen, everybody, I, as you can tell, there's, there's a lot going on right now. And I, Jonathan, and I've been talking a lot recently because there's a new documentary out that's now, I think is going to really go mainstream because it's not somebody with a tinfoil hat that's down in their basement with all in shadow and, and, and a changed voice in, in explaining this to people, but, um, it's really government, government authorities and Dennis Quaid is the, uh, host. so grid down power up is a great documentary I, I recommend everybody see. Now I'll tell you right now, it is, it'll scare the living daylights out of you. And that's a good thing. Um, this is part of the education. The other thing I would say is Jonathan just released Survival Theory 2 on Amazon. It's already shot up to number one in the bestsellers. And if you are looking for, I mean, look, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of books you can go out there. They're going to be these gigantic tomes of, of history. And those are valuable. If you're looking for kind of a shortcut to really help understand it, I like the Cliff's Notes version myself. So it's Jonathan's book is a really good explanation of trying to relate to people the reality that to, of what you can expect to see out there. So I highly recommend go right now over to Amazon and or wherever you're getting books and and go ahead and look up Survival Theory Two. Grab it right now. It's gonna you're gonna I got as soon as I started I got an advanced. PDF version. I feel I'm, I'm kind of special. And as soon as you start reading it, it's riveting. It, it just sucks you right in. And I think especially if you have any family members that are maybe reluctant, don't really feel like the same way you do. They don't really have the belief of being prepared. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. I've lived it myself. I think that that documentary is a really good uh, way to start. And I think that you being able to read Survival, Ther Survival Theory 2 from a very pragmatic standpoint keeps you out of the tinfoil hat zone where you can relate the truth to people much better. The people that you care about, the people that are going to be looking to you to provide for them and protect them when things happen. This threat is here. It is right now. The immediacy can be any moment. And that's not, that's not fear porn. That's, that's just reality. 
So the steps that you need to take need to happen right now too. So start with education and then take the steps from there. There's some really great, um, there are some great resources inside of Jonathan's book also, and he has some other things. And if you want to reach out to him to find out more about like his personal consulting or things that you can do, be able to get into his his uh, universe a little bit better and, and, and draw from his brain, you can see why I think it's imperative. So you can go visit him right now over at griddownconsulting.com. And until our next broadcast, this is Jeff Anderson saying, 